You know, I, I'm curious, um, why 12 apostles? I mean, uh, all the numbers in the Bible, are they divine? Isaac Newton, who I'm a big fan of, he, he dedicated his life work with the Bible in mind. And so I, I'm curious, what's your opinion about the, any numbers, the dimensions, tabernacle, are, all these things have specific numbers associated with them. Are those particular numbers divine in nature? Well, I, I, I think it would depend on, on what you mean by the question. I, I, don't think, I don't think math was invented by God. I don't think numbers are, you know, have some sort of, no, you know, he had a spiritual life or something like that. I wouldn't use the word divine. I, yeah. I, I, I would say that I would say that the order that math helps us see and understand, in other words, the elegance or the symmetry of creation, of nature, of, of life as it runs, you know, all the stuff that math applies to, which is frankly just about everything. Um, all of that stuff, math is, is a human invention. There are, there are different mathematical schemes, but they all uh, bring, to, bring into view design. And I do think design is part of creation. Uh, so ultimately, numbers and math take us back to a creator uh, through, through the root of the order and the symmetry that uh, they help us discern and understand. So that's the way I would approach it. I, it. I think it might just be a language difference there. But like specific numbers in, in scripture, mm -hmm. uh, I, do, I do think some of them um, have, are there for more than just counting. I mean, you have, you brought up the number 12 specifically. And, and again, while we do have the 12, which is the tribes of Israel, which is the apostles, and then you put them together and you get the 24 elders and all that kind of stuff. I mean, well, while I think there is certainly uh, something to that, I also think that, you know, th this might freak some people out unless they've, they've read fairly deeply into some of the stuff I've done, or, or if they read the portent, let's put it that way. But I think there are certain numbers like 12 that have to do also with uh, the zodiac, what I would call astral theology, and I don't mean astrology like Miss Cleo, you know, like who am I going to marry, how much money am I going to make, and all that kind of nonsense. Uh, the 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 assumption in the ancient world among Jews, this is why you have you find zodiac mosaics in Jewish synagogues. Well, were they apostates? Well, no, they're not. But their their belief was that hey, we read Genesis. And it says that God made the stars and he made the, the, the heavenly celestial objects and they're for times and seasons. And this is language right out of Genesis. So, so they're, they're, they're put there by God and God's in control of them. And we can look up at the sky ourselves and we can see patterns. And so maybe, just maybe, if we really sort of watch that long enough, maybe we could figure out that God is is either trying to communicate what he's doing or we could sort of somehow understand that he's up to something. And you get this in Psalm 19 and it's specifically Paul's use of Psalm 19. Again, for, pe for people who've read uh, the portent, this is not going to be unfamiliar. But if you go to Romans 10, we, you know, this is Paul's discussion. Well, I'll go back to verse 14. Paul is talking about, you know, the Jews and the Gentiles and all this stuff and the Messiah. And he says in verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. But I ask, Paul says, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. For their voice, here, here he starts quoting Psalm 19. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now, if you go back in Psalm 19, there's a text critical issue in Psalm 19. It either says, it's talking about the sun, moon, and stars, you know, all that kind of stuff in, in Psalm 19. And it says, either their voice has gone out to all the earth, that's the Septuagint. That's what Paul quotes. In other words, somehow they believed that the stars could speak. They could message something. And Paul's actually saying, he's actually connecting that idea to the gospel, or at least to, to, to Christ. The Masoretic text says, 
their line has gone out to all the earth. And that's a reference to the ecliptic, of course, which is the, the path that the constellations follow, the constellations of the zodiac. So I use that for an illustration to say that there was this idea that God could communicate things through the heavens. Again, this isn't astrology as we think of it because it's, it's, you know, scholars refer to it as astral theology or astral prophecy. Um, it, it's, a, it's a known genre much later in the Greco-Roman world. And a lot of people, I, I shouldn't say a lot of people, some people think that Revelation is largely an astral theological book. And I think there's something to that. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as, as some others. And I don't think that Paul is saying that you could look at the constellations and sort of get the Romans road out of it. What I think Paul is actually uh, alluding to here is is what we read in Revelation 12. Now, I can't prove that, but that's my suspicion. Uh, I think that, that the tradition we have, rec- we've, we have preserved in Revelation 12 about, and, and I actually take, when, when John says, I looked up at the heavens and saw, I think he's, I think he's serious. I think John is reporting in Revelation 12 what the Magi saw in the sky at the time of the Messiah's birth. And I think Paul picks up on that. And so the point is that people could have known that a divine king had arrived. And it just so happened that if you do the math, here we are back to math, if you do the math, you can arrive at a specific date that I think, again, not coincidentally, coincides with Rosh Hashanah, which is the day of the inauguration of every new Israelite king. And it also coincides with uh, Jewish tradition about Noah and the timing of the flood. And we all, you know, we go back to Genesis 6 and let's have a party there. I mean, there's all these things, again, that are converging in the birth of the Messiah. I think that that really, yes, that, that some numbers in Scripture do telegraph these sorts of ideas, um, and and this is a little bit beyond your normal gematria. Uh, if you're if you're familiar with gematria, that that's when you, certain languages the the letters of the alphabet corresponded to numbers. Greek does that, Hebrew does that, Aramaic did it. You know, not not every language does, but a lot of them did. And so there are places. Six 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 is the best example, where you know he gives you the numbers. So you don't ha- you're not supposed to guess at the number. You're supposed to guess at what the number means, and it's a human number. Well, no kidding, you know, but that, that, that's actually a hint as to how to think about it. It's gematria. That number means something. And not only does it mean something in terms of the letters that the numbers form, but that has to be framed within a certain wider context, which is what a lot of people don't do when they interpret uh, 666 and other things in Revelation. Um, the dove, when, when Jesus is baptized— you know, that the spirit descends on him, you know, like a dove. Well, there is no Old Testament passage that, that has that sort of imagery. Uh, you go back to Genesis 1, the hovering. It's not a dove there. Uh, you actually don't have a, a bird named, you know. It, it, but if you take the Greek word for dove and put it into, you know, put it through the gematria mill, the sum total of those letters is, again, I don't think coincidentally, the same sum total as the letters alpha and omega. Again, I, I just don't think that's accidental. There's another one in John I don't want to bring up, the 153 fish, because I use that in the portent. That would be a plot spoiler. But there are just things like this going on that transcend the text. And I, and I do think there is a biblical numerology. I think a lot of what you'd pick up and read uh, sort of is too imaginative. It just sort of takes the ball and runs with it all over the place. Uh, what The way I think it should be approached is – can you situate what you think is going on here? A, it, does it have exegetical foundation? And the thing I just gave you in Romans 10 does, because Paul is quoting Psalm 19. Okay, does it have exegetical foundation? And does it make sense within the wider ancient Near Eastern, ancient Mediterranean culture of the time? Uh, if, you can, if you can situate you know, what, what you think you see, uh, in those two ways, and I think you might be on to something. So certain numbers do have, you know, that sort of appeal. The number 40, I think, is is uh, artificial. And what I mean by that is if you, if you actually concord that, it's like everything in the Old Testament happens in 40s. Again, that, that, that's a, that is a little too coincidental for me. I think the, the point there is either a generational thing or it's a literary way that people back then would have understood as, 
as uh, completing a generation or completing a reign or something like that. It, there's this completion aspect to it uh, because it, it just shows up everywhere. You know, it's, it, it has its own sort of broad associations because of where it's used. So some numbers I think certainly uh, have, I guess I could say, divine telegraphing because again under inspiration they're being used to, to telegraph certain ideas but but in and of themselves you know numbers i don't think there's any divine quality uh, about math or about numbers i think it just depends on their usage it's something that uh, i'm going to to dip into again because it's it, it's quite fascinating um you know there's and, and because again 666 my mind just goes back to because if you're, you know, if you're just doing gematria with 666, and, you know, we, we've all read this stuff. Oh, it was Henry Kissinger. Oh, it was this president. Oh, it was that guy. Oh, it's Nero. Oh, it's – if that's all you're doing, you're just scratching the surface. There are things that you are not thinking about and probably aren't even aware of that you need to be thinking about that will help you make sense of that – um, maybe for a different reason, but uh, I don't I don't want to get too far into that uh, because there's there's a number of directions it could take. And again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend I'm a prophet. I'm not a prophet, um, but there are there are things that I could see as possibilities there that I've I've not seen in print. Uh, let's just put it that way. Um, it it there are one or two that that you could find in what I like to refer to as the fugitive literature. You know, again, this this academic stuff that maybe ten scholars in the world will ever find that article and read it, which is unfortunate. But there are just things going on there, or at least potentially going on there, that your popular prophecy writers just put them away. <laughs> just put them away. Uh, that, that's probably one of the best pieces of, of advice I can give you. And if you want some leads, I'm more than happy to give them to you. Uh, but the the popular stuff just put it away 